Today is February 23rd, 2012. I'm Chris Babel, and we're talking with Eric Lander. Professor Lander is founding director of the Broad Institute and director of its genome biology program. He is also a professor of biology at MIT. He is one of the principal leaders of the he Human Genome Project. Professor Lander is the recipient of numerous honors and awards and co-chairs President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He earned his BA in mathematics from Princeton in 1978 and his PhD in mathematics from Oxford University in 1981 as a Rhodes Scholar. Thanks very much for coming in to talk to us today. Pleasure to be here. So uh, I know you were born in Brooklyn. Uh, tell me a little bit about growing up. I was born in Brooklyn on Flatbush Avenue and Linden Boulevard. Um, and Brooklyn's a great place to be from. I, uh, my family moved to the Flatlands area of Brooklyn. Um, grew up as a Mets fan, although I abandoned them once I moved to Boston to become a Red Sox fan. Um, and went to school uh, taking the LL train from Canarsie into Manhattan to 14th Street and 1st Avenue where I went to Stuyvesant High School. Were your parents New York born and bred, or did they? They were. Both my parents were born and bred in New York. So, and you attended Stuyvesant High School, you said. Uh, talk about, about that, and, and kind of, I know that there were some sort of interesting things that happened to you very early on in your life in terms of math and, and science. Well, I mean, Stuyvesant was an amazing place. I mean, it was a place where, you know, for a hundred years, lower middle class kids uh, from the city have been able to go and just have their eyes opened as to what's possible. Yeah, growing up in the neighborhood I grew up in, not a lot of people did science, got uh, PhDs, not that many people that had gone to college. And to go to a place like Stuyvesant, a free public high school that was just steeped in science and math and it was eye-opening. It was wonderful. It was just all sorts of other kids who really loved math and science. So in ninth grade, I remember, I don't know how it happened, but I got, somehow went and found the math team. And the math team was an amazing thing. We met at, nine, at 8 o'clock in the morning, an hour before class, and for an hour, the kids ran the math team. There was um, the captain of the math team who carried the shopping bag. These were in the pre-web days, pre-portable computer days, so that the database of problems available to the math team were carried in a particular shopping bag that became the possession of the captain of the math team. And the students ran the math team. There was a wonderful faculty advisor, uh, Irene Finkel. And for an hour, five days a week, we did math problems. And then the team competed, and uh, pretty much every year, uh, Stuyvesant was the leading team in the city. We competed with Bronx Science and Brooklyn Tech, and uh, it was great. I loved it, and many other things I loved about Stuyvesant. It was it was just an exciting environment, a very intellectual environment, very different than anything I'd been to. I still credit it as um, having played a huge role. I can't imagine what I'd be doing if I hadn't, through luck, ended up uh, going to Stuyvesant. Was mathematics always something you knew you were interested in or excelled at? Or? No, not at all, actually. Um, I, uh, I got interested in math a little bit in sixth grade when I had a great uh, teacher, a guy called Jack Druckmann, who I later found out wasn't actually a math teacher at all. He was a social studies teacher who was just covering math, but he was a wonderful guy, and he got us interested in math. And uh, I, I remember you know, some early math competition in sixth grade where each class had one student uh, go up and I was representing our class and it was kind of fun and he, he made that interesting. But I didn't particularly uh, know that I wanted to do math until I got to Stuyvesant and that really opened my eyes to it. But I did, I did think that uh, a math science school would be a really fun place and so uh, that's why I went there. But it, it was really getting captivated by the math team. When <coughs> when you joined the math team or discovered math, I mean, can you sort of talk about what it was that appealed to you about? Yeah, it was camaraderie. It was it was it was a team spirit. I suppose it's the same thing as joining the football team, perhaps, except at Stuyvesant, the football team, well, the athletic teams at, at Stuyvesant being named after this this fourth colonial governor of uh, New Amsterdam, uh, who had a wooden leg. The the teams were all called the Peg Legs. And as you would imagine, football teams and track teams known as the peg legs 
you know, somehow failed to inspire the appropriate awe and excitement. And so the math team was actually a more important team at my high school than the football team was. But it's like a team spirit. It was being part of something bigger than yourself, sharing something with others, sharing the pleasure of doing something, sharing the prep of doing it, sharing winning or losing with others. And that kind of team spirit appealed to me greatly. Um, and then beyond it, just amazing teachers. Somehow Stuyvesant collected a set of remarkable public school teachers who really cared about science and math. I took an amazing earth science course as a ninth grader, and then biology and chemistry and physics and calculus, and they were all just taught by just remarkably good teachers. I don't quite know how it happened that, you know, I don't know if you could do it today, but somehow in the 1970s, one was able to attract some pretty amazing people to teach in the public high schools, and we all benefited from it. We also did some ridiculous things like mechanical drafting. We learned how to use a T-square and triangles to draw pictures, which on the whole, I think, you know, were relics of the er of, of kind of, you know, industrial arts that Stuyvesant had early on, and I confess that in the modern computer age that it's kind of hard to justify having learned how to do that, but I suppose you know, it, it, it developed some level of care and, and mechanical skill. So, Was there any <coughs> thought about an academic career or any career based on mathematics at that point, or was it purely just the joy of... That was yeah. the joy. I mean, I had no particular idea what an academic career meant until another wonderful thing. In New York City, Columbia ran the Columbia Science Honors Program, where kids in New York could take the train on Saturday morning up to either the Columbia Morningside Heights campus or the 168th Street Medi Medical School campus and take a set of courses taught by college faculty to high school students. And I remember having taken an astronomy course and something in immunology and then an amazing course taught, um, I think, by Wilfred Schmidt on Galois theory when I was a junior. And it was a real honest-to-God math course course of the sort you'd have in college, and uh, we met on Saturdays, and he proved theorems, and, uh, and I went for an hour and a half. We had a coffee break. It was the first time I learned to drink coffee. I later discovered you know, that Columbia's math department's coffee was not a model for how coffee should be done. It was usually burned coffee, but it was sort of a very grown-up kind of thing, and, and you know, we learned grown-up math, and I thought Galois theory was amazing. That was the first time I'd met a college professor and began to realize that you know, people actually made a living doing this kind of thing. The other really transformational thing was um, the National Science Foundation funded a program called the Hampshire College Summer Studies and Mathematics Program under some NSF science, summer science programs where, um, oh, I don't know, some number, maybe it's 100 kids from around the country would come and spend six weeks at Hampshire College doing a wonderful math enrichment course and this this was again fantastic because it was you know six weeks six days a week about six hours a day doing math but not problems but discovery they were courses around finding patterns phrasing conjectures proving things and Again, finding a camaraderie, a, a group of people who loved doing it, who did it for fun, but opening one's eyes to the idea that math wasn't just about either solving problems or learning about other people's previous theorems. It was about actually discovering things yourself. So that was eye-opening. In, in my last two weeks at Hampshire, I ended up working on a math problem that ended up being the basis of my Westinghouse project in my senior year. I ended up winning the Westinghouse contest for project on quasi-perfect numbers um, and you know learning how to do research as a you know between my junior and senior year in high school was pretty cool and proving a theorem nobody had ever proven before it wasn't the most important theorem in the world but it was a theorem and uh, you know so it, it, it these were pretty amazing experiences by the time I got out of high school um, having really learned about team spirit, having seen what a college course was like, having learned to discover something yourself. When you discover something yourself, it's kind of addictive and, and you want more of it. Um, and uh, you know, then having fallen into being on the, the um, U.S. Uh, math team that went to the International Math Olympiad. My junior year was the first year that the U.S. 
had a U.S. Um, math Olympiad, and uh, they, they had it, and I ended up, uh, I think, scoring second in the country on that. And so that was a nice thing, but much more exciting was this my senior year, the U.S. sent the team to the International Math Olympiad, which had been started by the communist countries and um, had been running for, I don't know, a dozen or 13 years. And uh, they actually sent a bunch of us to East Germany before we had diplomatic relations with East Germany. And uh, that was an amazing experience as well. So we ended up doing okay. They were a little afraid we were going to get crushed by the Soviet bloc, but we came in second. We lost by only a few points to the Russians, which was an amazing performance given what everybody's expectations were. And we colossally pissed off the Hungarians, who were legendarily good mathematicians and always vied for second or first with the Russians by actually beating the Hungarians. So the U.S. You know, got itself on the map. So anyway, that whole set of experiences, wonderful, wonderful set of high school experiences that couldn't have happened any place but Stuyvesant. And, um, you know, it, it then sent me off to college really being interested in mathematics. And I chose to go to Princeton for two reasons. One, because they had a great math department. And two, because um, Princeton looked nothing like New York City. It was green. They had these trees and things and grass and other, other kinds of innovations that were not so common in, in New York City. And um, I wanted to be someplace different. So I went there and had a great time. So. You, you mentioned the camaraderie. Was there also, did you sort of enjoy the, the <coughs> sense of competition? I would assume there must have been, it must have been quite a pressure cooker when you're sort of on an international stage like that. Was no, that it actually, it turns out it wasn't because, you know, the, the math competition, uh, the, you know, what are you going to get? It's not like you're getting big prizes or anything like that. I think, uh, you know, uh, you work by yourself, and you do the best you can. Uh, mostly what we enjoyed was that, for example, we hung out with the Soviet team. The Soviets felt that uh, we were in East Germany. They ran East Germany. They couldn't possibly get in any trouble, so they could do any kind of hooliganism they wanted to. And so the Soviet team and the American team, being two super superpowers in what was basically a client state of one of them, uh, decided to, to hang out and make trouble. So we, we filled water balloons and went up to the top of a tall building, a 10, 10 story building in Erfurt, East Germany, and lobbed water balloons down onto passing traffic, uh, confident in the knowledge that the Soviet team was pretty much immune, and if we were hanging out with the Soviet team, we were okay. Um, so I remember it much more for the experience of the camaraderie with other teams. I met a guy called John Cremona on the British team, who ended up being my office mate at Oxford when I went to graduate school. Um, I uh, you know, remember a variety of the other teams and things. And I remember you know, experiencing what a communist country was like for the first time, and later walking around East Berlin. So for me, it was much more, again, part of the eye-opening experience. The, you know, a key, lower middle class kid from Brooklyn having his eyes opened, it, there was no real pressure around this. And, you know, in the New York City math competition, we were pretty good. We, we didn't feel a lot of pressure either because we pretty much won. And so it was just fun. Um, I enjoyed it tremendously. And the, sa <coughs> the same with Westinghouse. I, uh, yeah. I was talking to Tom Layton the other day, and he same year he as still I. remembers that you, I think you won, and he was the runner-up or a runner-up. He was third. Third, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was first. There was a girl called Linda Bockenstead who was second, and Tom was third. And I did a paper on uh, number theory, and he did a paper on analytic number theory. Uh, so we both were doing things on primes. I was... Uh, you know, it, it was great, but that's where I met Tom Layton. So these two MIT faculty trace back to that same Westinghouse. Yeah, I mean, again, the distinctions were arbitrary. Um, I think you could have ordered them any way you did, but it was, again, it was a great experience. I remember meeting all of these wonderful kids who did different kinds of things. I remember also the delinquency we engaged in there. One of the students had as his Westinghouse project a laser. Uh, and back in those days when building a laser was a big deal, and he built a laser. And I remember you know, being on the high floor of the Shoreham Hotel when he was firing his laser out into traffic, confusing cabbies and things like that with this red light and other kinds. I'm sure the statute of limitations has expired on this delinquency by now. But in any case, it was fun. 
it was enjoyable. It really said there was a life for people who loved ideas, loved math, loved science, and that these were fun people. Um, got to meet, you know, older Glenn Seaborg, Nobel laureate, chemistry, was you know, very much involved in the Westinghouse. You get to meet people like that. So for me, I just recall the whole thing as being fun. I recall, you know, nothing about pressure or anything like that. It was just, you know, watch the world expand and unfold and see how many great things there are. That's what great institutions do, is they take great young people and they just show them all the possibilities they'd ne never otherwise know. And so I just feel enormously grateful. It makes me think about how many fantastic people there are around the country and then around the world who could do all these things and never get the chance to do it. So it's really great to see more and more ways where people can get drawn in and just find out how much fun this stuff is. <coughs> so how did you like Princeton? I mean, as a, as a kid from Brooklyn, going to a completely different environment, was it, was it tough? Was, was it fun and, and eye-opening again? Or? Well, again, I mean, I gravitated toward uh, you know, places where I could have that kind of camaraderie. There wasn't the equivalent of the math team, but there was the Daily Princetonian newspaper. So my freshman year, within a couple weeks, I passed by the um, offices of the Daily Princetonian one evening when they had some open house with beer and pretzels and whatever. Um, I think the drinking age was actually lower then. And uh, you know, went in and hung out and met people and decided writing for the newspaper could be fun. And so I, for the next three and a half years, just wrote for the newspaper. I um, became a reporter for the Daily Princetonian and pretty much spent every afternoon at the Prince, which was, a, again, a group of people working together pr to produce a common product. The paper was entirely student produced and edited, and it was a daily. So it meant that, you know, we were constantly covering stories. And so I. I was the only math major who did anything like that. Uh, it was very rare to find people who were in the math department and actually in journalism, but I loved it. And it gave me, again, what I was missing, which was, or, you know, what I wanted, which was to have some group of people and feel you were part of something bigger than yourself, producing a product that was important in some way and a shared product. And so that was a blast. And if you called up administrators, they took your call because you said, I'm calling from the Daily Princetonian. If they blow you off, well, that. You can write what you want, you know, and they, they, they need to be able to have their voice in the story, and that gave you a sense of power, and that taught me a lot, too, that, you know, if you're in the right position, you can get people to answer for things, and um, so I, I had a fantastic time doing that. Now, you know, as culturally, coming as a lower middle class kid from Brooklyn, Princeton is an environment where there are many kids who come from much more economic privilege, and one feels, you know, those differences much more acutely. In New York City, I never really noticed those differences. At Princeton, I certainly did notice that there were people who came from you know, much greater means, and that was, that was interesting and different. And you know, being a Jewish kid at Princeton, as opposed to you know, kids from other backgrounds, when I think you know, we were still not that all far from the period when anti-Semitism was, was allowable. It wasn't that it was overt, it's just you know, back in the days of the early 1970s, mid-1970s, one would, you know, being Jewish or being, I'm sure, many other sort of things was a little more distinct than it, than it is today. And so there were a lot of those interesting experiences, but I just loved Princeton. It was, it was great. It was, it was, again, culturally eye-opening for me in a lot of ways. The faculty were amazing. They were, they were, um, oh, I mean, I hung out with, politics professors and came to know and love them, a guy who uh, did public opinion polling research, and I started the first public opinion poll at Princeton as part of the newspaper. It was a wonderful law professor, Walter Murphy, um, lots of great, great math professors, and very generous with their time, and it was really an undergraduate-focused place. So I got a lot of that, met people who were vastly more international than I had met in New York. I mean, the New York was ethnically diverse, but internationally we didn't meet as many such people. And, you know, there were bits and times that it's, you know, uncomfortable because you don't belong to some majority group or some clique or whatever, but that's actually a pretty useful thing, too. Um, met many interesting peers. Um, when I was a senior, I was a resident advisor in a dorm looking after 18 freshmen, and that was a fun experience. Some of them have gone on to 
do really good things. One writes for the New Yorker, another one is on the Supreme Court. Elena Kagan was one of my freshman advisees, and I even could tell you then she was going to do well. And so, you know, it was just, it was just wonderful. I, I had a fantastic time. Um, I, uh, uh, my senior year, served on the university's what's called priorities committee, which sets the budget. Uh, recommends the budget to the trustees, and so I learned something about university administration. Um, I don't know, it was great. It, it, it again just shows what fantastic institutions can do for people. So <coughs> you got a, a Rhodes, which was so no no small feat, uh, and went to Oxford to study mathematics. I right, did my PhD at Oxford in doing mathematics, and that was, uh, again, a very different sort of experience. Um, Oxford had superb math department. Um, I had a wonderful advisor, Peter Cameron, um, with whom I did algebraic combinatorics, um, and got to Europe. One of the great things about Oxford is that um, you have eight-week terms followed by six-week vacations. Eight-week terms, six-week vacation, eight-week terms, summer vacation. So you're on for about 24 weeks and off for the rest of the year. And if you're doing biochemistry, you have to be at the lab bench. But if you're doing pure math for your thesis, it's pretty portable. So almost all the good results that I produced that became the basis for my thesis, I mean, well, none of them were produced in my office at, at, at the Maths Institute at Oxford. And the majority of them were produced in other countries. Uh, you know, there's a theorem. There was uh, lunch outside Notre Dame, and there was a theorem that was breakfast in southern Spain, and there was another theorem that was actually in Oxford, but waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning in my bed sit on Hollywell Street. And so, um, again, it was eye-opening in all sorts of wonderful ways to live in a different country and, and meet such a diverse collection. The Rhodes Scholars and the Marshall Scholars were very interesting. The, the British students were very interesting, as I mentioned before. Uh, one of the people from the British Olympiad team was an office mate of mine at Oxford. Um, I ended up finishing my thesis pretty quickly, wrote the th you know, produced a thesis in about two years, and my third year I kind of uh, defended it and then hung out at Oxford, having finished my degree and taking you know, random courses here and there. I took Chinese for about a year and a half because it was very different than math and it was kind of fun. I, Spent a month in the spring of my last year teaching in uh, the Netherlands at the Technische Hochschule in Eindhoven, giving a series of lectures there. And again, it was just fun. I remember the whole time as kind of just being fun. So, so you obviously have had an extremely interesting career tra trajectory since then. And and there was a, a point where uh, you decided not to pursue mathematics as you know, as, or an academic career in mathematics. Um, yeah, yeah so at least to not be a math professor. Yeah, right? right. I ended right. up still doing mathematics. Yes, well, exactly. It turns so out yes, that, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, right. so tell me about that thought process and and what led you, I guess, first to uh, teaching management at Harvard and, and on well, to you know, um, I loved math obviously, but I also began to realize that the life of a pure mathematician might not match all this fun I was having being part of these, you know, shared enterprises, whether it was the math team or the newspaper or other things like that. Um, but I really liked doing things as a community, collaboratively, being part of something bigger than myself. And, you know, really great pure mathematics just isn't done that way. It's done in your own head or with one other good collaborator, and that's pretty much what math is. And it should be. I mean, I don't say it should be anything else. But I knew that just in terms of lifestyle, it wasn't the kind of intellectual style that worked for me. So um, around my second year in graduate school, I began to realize this and cast about for what was I really going to do. I liked worldly things. I wrote for the newspaper. I did some freelance writing while I was in graduate school. And I wanted to somehow be in the world. So I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I reached out and found a Princeton professor, Ed Tufte, who had then moved to Yale. Um, this is the Ed Tufte who wrote these wonderful books on visualization of quantitative data. He had taught political science at Princeton. And uh, somehow persuaded him to see me. I went up to Yale and saw him. And um, Ed suggested you should go talk to Fred Mosteller at the School of Public Health, who has brought statistics and uh, mathematics to, to public health. Um, 
And I saw him, and he was very kind, very nice, and said, well, yeah, we can give you a job at the School of Public Health, but you don't actually know any statistics, which was correct. And so he called Howard Rafa, who was a professor at the Harvard Business School, who had been a mathematician in the 1950s, who had come to the business school and helped found the field of decision analysis and written important books on decision analysis and cases at the business school and pretty much on the basis of one very nice lunch with the department, they hired me despite the fact that I knew no economics and they were in the Department of Managerial Economics, but they figured what the hell, I was a Rhodes Scholar in mathematics. I could obviously learn the material and so they gave me a job teaching uh, uh, at the business school and I taught MBAs, Managerial Economics. So that was very much in the world. So, so far this is not the typical bi biography of an MIT biology professor. Not uh, yet, no, no, this is not. <laughs> and if you, I mean, the only biology course I had taken up to this point was uh, sophomore biology in high school, and I really disliked it because it was mostly memorizing bits of the cat brain and memorizing bits of cellular structure, sort of the area of science I least liked. Um, so I started teaching the business school, and um, uh, I ended up being a very good teacher. I got the best teaching ratings in the department and some of the best teaching ratings in the school. And because the Harvard Business School takes teaching very seriously, they pretty much gave me a free pass to do what I wanted because you know, I, was, I was successfully teaching. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I cast about and explored, it, explored some economics and eventually decided that Economics just didn't excite me the same way. It was the, the height of rational expectations theory, and uh, man was this homo economist able to calculate rational expectations, equilibrium, and, and it just didn't ring true. It just didn't seem to capture the richness of, of how people really operate. You know, economics has moved on since then, but, um, um, and my brother was younger than me by a year and a half and was a was a um, neurobiology student, said we should learn about the brain. And he sent me these papers on mathematical models of the cerebellum. Uh, I said, you know, you, you, you wrote a book. I, I was writing a book on coding theory and algebraic coding theory. And he said, the brain, you know, it's got codes and things. So he sent me these papers. I read them. The math part sounded pretty hokey to me. Uh, it was tensor theory applied to the cerebellum. The cerebellum sounded pretty interesting. So I started, you know, in this wonderful, hopelessly naive way one is in one's early 20s, to start learning about the cerebellum and uh, learning about the brain. And Oh, sat in on random courses. I sat in on Harvard's neurobiology course at some point. I think the first thing I did though was I sat in, I realized in order to know about the brain, I would need to know about cell biology. And then in order to know about cell biology, I'd have to learn about molecular biology. And I'd have to learn about that. I'd have to learn about genetics. And anyway, so I sat in on a random course at Harvard. It led me back to some uh, graduate student who was teaching the lab in the course, who took me back to his advisor, a guy called Peter Cherbis, who ran a Drosophila lab at Harvard. And Peter and his wife, Lucy, who ran the lab together, offered me a bench in the lab. It was kind of weird, this math business professor, but gave me a bench in the lab, taught me how to do molecular biology at night. So I was moonlighting, doing uh, cloning of genes in Drosophila, and um, while still teaching my course at the business school. And I then met the guy down the hall, Bill Gelbart, a fly geneticist who did different kind of genetics and worked with Bill for a while, all while still teaching in the business school. And I somehow convinced the business school to let me take a sabbatical, which you know, happens around f fourth year or so, they let you do things like that. And go down to MIT, and I recall having said something about wanting to do artificial intelligence, but really ended up working out with Bob Horvitz that I would come hang out in his lab for a bit and made mutants in Bob's lab of uh, suppressors of UNC8 and learning some more genetics. And oh, Bob ended up on sabbatical much of that year. And uh, Barbara Meyer, professor down the hall, this was in, in Building 56, introduced me to David Potstein after a seminar one day. And as they say, the rest was history. David had been on the prowl for about four or five years for somebody who knew math and knew genetics to take on some problems in the genetics of complex human traits. And Barbara introduces me in the way I least like to be introduced. Here's this mathematician who's learning biology, because most biology professors, you know, when you hear somebody's mathematician run the other way, Barbara knew what she was doing, and David immediately pounced and said, okay, well, I have this problem, and blah, 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 blah. 
it'd be impossible to do that. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and I listened to it and I said, oh, no, that's bullshit. You could do that. And, you know, we started arguing. We got, we got markers. We went back to chalk. We went to the board. We started arguing. We agreed to meet later. Does it happen? David had published this incredibly important paper in 1980 on mapping genetic markers. Uh, mapping diseases relative to genetic markers, finding the genes for diseases relative to genetic markers. And um, he was supposed to give a keynote address at the Human Gene Mapping 5 meeting in Helsinki in the summer of 1985. And David hadn't really done any more work on the problem since his 1980 paper, which is, you know, always awkward, because what are you going to say? People know the 1980 paper. So David and I began working on all sorts of ways to apply these techniques to more complex diseases and uh, you know, producing what became the content for David's keynote address. And David invited me to come. It was my first meeting that I'd ever been to in biology and um, went to Helsinki that summer. And, and you know, by this point, I was totally hooked by human genetics. Um, I didn't actually resign my position at the business school. I kept it and continued to teach at the business school for a while. But uh, by this point, it was totally hooked. Um, and so to make a long story short, David Botstein somehow convinced David Baltimore, then the director of the Whitehead Institute, to offer me a position as a Whitehead Fellow where I could open a small lab group. And um, I did while still teaching the business school. And for about three or so years, I ran a lab as a Whitehead Fellow. And around 1989, I had already published, I don't know, 20 papers in biology or some, something like that. And um, Harvard Biology Department decided to offer me a tenured position in biology. David then went to the MIT Biology Department and countered with a tenured position at MIT. So I stayed because uh, I thought MIT was an amazing place and the Whitehead was an amazing place. And so it's sort of the most unlikely career to end up here because I like I haven't taken a course in biology for a grade since high school. Um, I uh, didn't have any career path to, or so in in biology as a professor, and ended up going from being an untenured professor of managerial economics to getting two tenured offers from Harvard and MIT in <laughs> biology. It's, so it leaves me like singularly unqualified to advise my students on how to lead their life. It drives them crazy because, you know, it, it, it's a testament to how academia is not about punching your ticket through a defined series of steps you're supposed to take. It is about the unexpected. It's about you know, taking your interests and whatever talents you may have and seeing where they lead. And doing it around an environment with great, great people is, uh, is the key. I mean, when I was leaving Oxford, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I did decide I wanted to do it in Boston because I figured if I didn't know what I wanted to do, I should do it around great people. I should do it around a place where there's a lot of cool things going on and there would be lots of productive collisions. The only other advice I really got was, you know, spend time with really good, generous people. And I was lucky enough to find some amazingly good, generous people. Howard Rafa and, you know, uh, Peter Churbis and Bill Gelbart and Bob Horvitz and Barbara Meyer and David Botstein and David Baltimore and just pretty amazing. So, <coughs> of course, I want to uh, ask you about the genesis of the Human Genome Project and just how that, how everyone came together. and, and and how that started, but I'm, I want to back up for just a moment sure. to um, the sort of transition you made to biology, even before you really sort of became sort of interested in, in genetics. Um, what was it that, that just piqued your interest about molecular biology and cell biology? I mean, was it, was it, was it co computational, mathematical, or was it just kind of just something else? It was the genetics that piqued it, and it was that it was logical. Genetics is the most it's not mathematical in the mathematical sense, it's that it's logical. Um, genes are inferred to exist from certain laws. You can't see them initially. Now, of course, we can sequence them, but genes were inferred to exist by Mendel, and their positions on chromosomes were inferred to exist, and all sorts of things could be inferred from observation in a very logical way, and that just appealed to me tremendously. So I became really enamored of genetics and then molecular biology because of its logical structure. 
um, why do you fall in love with some intellectual things more than others? That was, that's what hooked me. One thing that, one thing that really strikes me just in thinking about how people, and I mean just the general public, including myself, talk about these things is that people use chromosomes, DNA, genes, almost interchangeably in sort of common speech. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could sort of talk about, you know, what is a gene and how does it <laughs> relate to DNA? And, uh, I mean, I can do it, but well, I, teach, I, I teach intro bio at MIT. I teach the 7012 introductory biology course. And since MIT has the fantastic open courseware, the right thing to do for anybody watching this video is instead to go, go listen to the OCW version of, of this. <laughs> But I, I, I <laughs> that's maybe the very short answer. So the very short answer, because yeah, I mean, I have, <laughs> I have an entire course on the web. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, the DNA is the entire strand of information. The chromosome is that DNA wrapped up in a certain way with proteins around it. A gene is a subsection of that DNA that specifies for some particular set of um, instructions, like a protein or an RNA that doesn't get translated, so either an RNA that turns into a protein or an RNA that doesn't turn into a protein. So it's one long linear hard disk, it's individual files on the hard disk, you could think about it like that. Yeah, but uh, large parts of that hard disk are not genes, right? They're, they're just Just not. like large parts of your hard disk are yeah. just, you know, stuff. So it's a good thing, if, unless your, your hard disk is filled, you know, to the gills, which it probably isn't completely filled to the gills. A lot of buffers, stuff, random noise in there. Um, and the same is true with the chromosome. In fact, in the case of the human, it's kind of extreme. Only about one and a half percent of the chromosome is actually genic in the sense of coding for a protein. Only about six percent, maybe seven percent, actually is functional at all. And, and do we know what that other stuff is doing there? Well, we know that about 50% of it is the detritus of transposable elements that have hopped around the genome and probably is functionless, except possibly a spacer. Um, in between the 6% and 50%, we don't really know. It could be that the vast majority of it is detritus. 50% we can recognize definitively as detritus. And, it, you know, the rest of it is kind of degenerated enough that we can't quite recognize. But it, I wouldn't be shocked to find that 75% of it was detritus where the precise sequence didn't matter. Because the evidence is that you know, for more than 90% of the genome, there's not any evolutionary constraint on holding that sequence fixed. So, so let's talk about the development of the, the human sure. genome project, which seems like uh, an extraordinarily audacious thing to attempt to do. I mean, if thinking back, 20 or more, 30 years, and yeah. the, the idea that, that that could even be accomplished seems rather remarkable. So how did, how did you get involved in it, and how did, that, how did the project begin? Well, the idea began to be floated in the mid-1980s, around 1985 or so. I was not responsible for the, this notion. I was, I was then coming into biology and um, was not in a position to propose we sequence the whole human genome, but um, a couple people proposed this nutty notion. It was just a nutty notion. But I did get invited to the 1986 Cold Spring Harbor meeting, which was the first time it was publicly debated. The idea had been floated only about 12 months earlier. And at Cold Spring Harbor, which is the annual symposium in, in the field of, of molecular biology, um, there was a public debate. And that was the first meeting I ever went and gave a talk at. So it was just fortuitous. People began to realize that, uh, assuming the molecular biology could get done, there was going to be a huge amount of data. So um, anyway, there was a public debate. I raised my hand in the middle of the public debate um, on two occasions. And you know, there's an auditorium, and you could raise your hand and decided what the hell. I would just throw myself in and said a couple things. and. Maxine Singer and Paul Berg, two of the deans of molecular biology, um, came over to me after the public session and said, oh, we liked what you said. It was really interesting stuff. Come to dinner. And so I went to dinner at Blackford Hall with them and talked more about the Human Genome Project. And Anyway, about two months later, I think, the NIH was holding a meeting on a Human Genome Project, the idea of the Human Genome Project. And they realized they needed people who knew some, something about mathematics to think about that. So they suggested me, and so I went. And so anyway, that's how I began to get involved in this thing. Um, and uh, because the kind of work I had done with David Botstein, 
was around whole genome mapping, how you would use the information from a whole genome. By 1985, 86, I was working on, on what you would do if you could map the entire genome. Uh, I got very involved in, in kind of the planning issues around the human genome, and then also began to realize that we, we would only have the data if we actually got the work done. And so I began to get very interested in actually how you could sequence the human genome. So with my startup funds at MIT in 1989, uh, you know, David Baltimore had given me startup funds. I basically blew my whole startup funds in six months to generate preliminary data for the first um, uh, call for proposals for human genome centers. So despite the fact that we had no experimental track record whatsoever, we ended up getting the best score on our application to be a human genome center, and we were one of the first four human genome centers created in the world. Um, and, you know, so we threw ourselves into the deep end of the pond by trying to take on the experimental work of sequencing the human genome. So. <clears throat> you know, when I rec recall the, uh, the the sort of journalistic and public accounts of, of that, that time in the very initial stages of the project, I mean, it was just seen as this almost insurmountable problem or challenge mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to, to get that amount of information out. And yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the, the challenges, whether they're technical, scientific, managerial? Yes, they were technical, scientific, <laughs> managerial. I mean, look, at the time, uh, it was going to require like a ten to 100,000 fold scale up in how you would do things. The, you know, Everything needed to be changed. We needed to access DNA in a different way. Um, this is before the polymer, you know, the, the project was proposed before the polymerase chain reaction was, was available, um, before any automated sequencing was available, before strategies for how you would assemble a genome of three billion bases were available. It was just a remarkable, audacious thing to say that let's start, and by starting, we will somehow force ourselves to invent the answers. Worked, worked wonderfully. Uh, you know, maybe it's like, I don't know enough about the history of the radar lab at MIT or other things or building the early internet, but you know, it's not obvi actually obvious how you're gonna build an internet connecting the country or, or radar or other, but you know, you start and then, then it forces you to come up with a solution. I mean, you know, Los Alamos, any of these things where, where you have something you want to get done. You have a lot of problems to solve. And again, you have this camaraderie of a team coming together to solve it. So you know, it was every single aspect of it was audacious. Um, and took took quite a while to get all the pieces coming together. The project put, f put the first so five, six years in laying the groundwork. And then another couple years getting that groundwork in a position to actually be able to be applied. Did people have any sense of how long it was going to take at the beginning? Yeah, it was said to be a 15-year project. Turned out to be a 13-year project. Not bad, given how little we knew. I mean, it was shockingly good. And when we talk about mapping the human genome, exactly what are we talking about? I mean, what what comes out the other end of that 13-year process? Well, the great thing is it comes out as a little memory stick that contains all the letters on chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, all just laid out. That's what comes out. It's, it's, in the end, very simple. It's, it's a linear sequence of letters across each chromosome. And I guess one of the things that I'm interested in talking about a little bit is the human genome obviously varies minutely from person to person. Yep. Uh, what, what is the human genome that we know, and how does that relate to an individual? That is, what, what human genome was sequenced? Well, what maybe what, is, what was sequenced, or when we talk about the human genome and having well. this map, is it? Look, if, if, if any two copies of the genome differ by one letter in a thousand, it doesn't matter. We, we, we can talk about the human genome as your genome or my, my genome. It doesn't much matter. It's, of course, it's not the human genome because they all differ slightly, but, you know, squint a little bit and it doesn't matter. So it's not a big problem. What is the difference in variation? One letter in a thousand. One letter in a thousand. That's a little less than one, one in thirteen hundred or so, plus some structural rearrangements and all that, but basically I think it's about one-tenth of a percent. So it's not too hard to say. If I have any one human genome, it's pretty close to any other human genome. And if I then begin to have enough of them, I can build, build a catalog of the variation that's there. So the other thing that, of course, was uh, made much of uh, during the, 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 the process, during the, during the project, was the public nature of the Human Genome Project and 
parallel private efforts to do the same work. And I, wanted, right. I was wondering if you could talk about. Well, the, the parallel private effort was a pretty late development. Um, what happened there was that uh, a company, ABI, uh, developed a, an automated sequencer that involved capillaries, which made certain aspects of the project better and easier and all that. And uh, what they did was they went out and they found uh, Craig Venter, who was one of the people part of the public project who had a center in Rockville, Maryland that was not doing too well, actually. Um, and induced Craig to um, do a project where they would give him large numbers of sequencers in return for privately generating the data. And this is already eight, nine years into the Human Genome Project where the vast majority of the foundation had been laid and then it was pretty close to the gear up stage. So at that point there came, I don't know, it was 98, 99, something like that, this big announcement that they were going to fund a private effort aimed at privately obtaining a sequence of the genome that they could patent and own and restrict. Um, it was a dumb idea. I mean, it would only work if you could prevent the public version. So that had to be the strategy. You had to make sure the public project would die because if you have a freely available public sequence and a private sequence, but there's a public one, it's not a great business strategy. Um, and so there were efforts to try to say that the private was enough and that the federal government should stop funding a public project. There was a lot of work, a lot of lobbying to try to prevent the public project from getting funded, uh, from, from continuing to get funded. But uh, to the contrary, the public project continued to get funded. And um, the two proceeded in parallel, and that ended up being a good thing because once there was that competitive spirit, everybody had to move very quickly. The federal government put some more money into it. It all got done even faster. And as predicted, um, as soon as a draft sequence was produced in 2000, 2001, within a year after that, the private company stopped with this human sequencing because there wasn't a lot of money to be made in it. They never really finished that sequence because it wasn't a good business proposition anymore. Uh, Craig went on to finish that sequence because it mattered to him to prove he could finish it, but it turned out not to be a great business proposition. The company, you know, its stock price spiked, but um, by a year or two later was down by 95 percent, and so it just never made sense as a business plan. But had we not insisted on the idea that this information needed to be freely publicly available, we'd be in a very different world because we now have the ability to take the human sequence and the mouse sequence and this sequence and all sort and combine them and mix them and match them and have freely available information. It's the difference between, you know, a Google of all the world's information and all the world's information living in different balkanized gardens behind big walls. So we have the map of the human genome. What happens what happens then? What what, well, what can we do with it? Just the ground floor. I mean then you want to start comparing. You want us to compare two people, a hundred people, a thousand people, a thousand people with diabetes and a thousand people without diabetes, and ask, what are the distinctive features in group A versus group B? A tumor versus the normal DNA which became that tumor. What are the mutations that occurred? A mouse and a human and a chimp and a rat. It's all differences. But once you have one sequence, you can then compare it to other sequences and begin to learn questions. And so what's happened in the last decade is a tremendous, tremendous amount of work to generate data. And this is probably a good idea, a good time for me to ask you about the founding of the Broad Institute and sure. the Broad's mission. Sure. So during the 1990s, when we were doing the Human Genome Project, it was clear that there were going to be lots of medical applications. And in the mid-1990s, we got, um, we began to collect around the Genome Center some smart young MD, PhDs, or MDs from around town who began hanging out because the Genome Project was exciting. There were a lot of new tools. And I went and raised some money from a consortium of three companies to support what we call the Functional Genomics Consortium. The Genome, was, genome Project was focusing on the structure of the genome, but this was a Functional Genomics Consortium. And uh, we got some money, about $8 million a year, to support projects. And the Genome Center became kind of a buzzing hub of young people from across town collaborating. 
from the Farber and the Mass General and uh, Brigham and and it was all totally unofficial. Thank God, nobody, nobody knew anything about it. You know, because institutional heads would agonize over who gets the overhead, and who's responsible if God forbid something goes wrong, and you know, who gets the IP, and we ignored all that. We just totally ignored it, and um, thank God we did because you know, uh, a bevy of lawyers could have brought this to an end, but uh, they didn't know about it. So by, um, oh, the year 2000 or so, we had 65 collaborations going on across town of young people from different institutions all centered at the Genome Center. And then it became clear the Human Genome Project was going to come to an end. So um, how were we going to keep this going? How were we going to institutionalize, bottle, make permanent this amazing energy that had been generated. And so we conceived the idea of creating an institution, an institute, permanent institute, uh, that would keep this going. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to do it within the Whitehead Institute where this was taking place because it had already risen to be about 75% of the budget of the Whitehead and it was just too imbalanced. And more importantly, the right community would be the whole MIT and Harvard community. So we went out with the idea to the two university presidents, Chuck Vest at MIT and Larry Summers, who was just beginning his tenure at Harvard, with this notion that we should make a joint institution between MIT, Harvard, and the Harvard hospitals. And you can imagine how simple that was. Uh, just get MIT and Harvard to collaborate on something. This is actually not often done, but you know, anyway, they um, Chuck and Larry were both visionaries, and they were both at certain times in their tenure, late in the case of Chuck, early in the case of Larry, when both had the ability to act for different reasons. And after only two years of work, you know, everybody was persuaded we should do it. And um, it helped a great deal when, when I found Eli Brode. And uh, Eli and his uh, fantastic wife, Edie, believed in this mission and offered to put up uh, a, a gift of $100 million to make it possible. So with that in hand, that actually helped focus the mind of both MIT and Harvard to, well, let's really do this. And that's how the Broad got created, as a real connector across this amazing MIT and Harvard community. So talk about, um, y you know, the, 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 the map is there. There are there's enormous potential in, in terms of what we can do with it. Talk a bit about the Broad's mission and sort of method for for working through this enormous f fount of information. Well, the, the scientific mission is to propel the understanding and treatment of disease. Um, the way you do it in the academic world is you empower amazingly smart young people. Young doesn't necessarily mean chronological age, because one of our amazingly smart young people is 72. It's Ed Skolnick, who's just extraordinary, but it's a state of mind. Young, excited, driven people. And you empower them by creating community and giving them access to capabilities. And so the Broad had learned from the Human Genome Project the power of collaboration, real deep collaboration, not the occasional I'll chat with you, but truly making teams where people work together. Um, and it had learned the power of having not just academic labs, but professional scientists, um, teams of the kinds of people you might find in industry, but working in a nonprofit setting, but not professors, but long-term PhD, you know, sophisticated scientists and, <coughs> and uh, technical personnel working as a team. So when you combine those, individual scientists, groups of labs that commit to working together, 15, 20 labs in cancer that work together, plus professional teams that might be 200 people involved in sequencing or other things like that, you can do amazing things. It means a young person with a great idea might want to take on a project that they couldn't possibly do on their own or do in their own lab, but through this network or through these professional teams we call platforms could do it. Maybe they want to take on chemical screening. They want to screen half a million compounds to see some, well, they're not going to set up half a million compounds in their lab. They're not going to have a graduate student do that. But if you had a professional team that can do that, then the graduate student can be empowered to try some amazing idea. And you know, so the road is about unlocking, unleashing the amazing creative energy by letting fantastic young scientists work together collaboratively 
to take on audacious projects in that same spirit as the Human Genome Project. It's not necessarily genomics, but it's the spirit of there's no reason we shouldn't do audacious things. Young people want to do audacious things. We want them to be able to do audacious things. We don't want them worrying about how do I get my next grant, how do I write my next paper. Yeah, those are important things, but that's not what you live for. You live to say, how are we going to cure cancer? You live to say, you know, how are we going to be able to program a cell to do anything that we want it to do? And you want people to mostly be focused on that. Yeah, we have to worry about grants and getting papers published and all that, but you want their imaginations to be big and uninhibited, and you want them to support each other by doing it. So the Broad is about creating an environment in which fantastic young people do that for each other. The beginning, you know, I supplied a lot of that energy, but as with all of these sort of uh, exothermic reactions, it, it sort of takes on a life of its own, and the energy liberated by this sparks more things and more things and more things. And now this spirit is owned by many, many, many people. And uh, people come to the Broad because of the people who are involved in the Broad. Uh, you know, the students support each other and, and the young faculty are helping each other. And, you know, I help some and I cheerlead some and I'm involved in a bunch of projects. But what's amazing is how much this model of teamwork and collaborative spirit works. And it's not teamwork where everybody is some ant in some army, or you're the 30, you know, 237th author on some particle physics paper. It's shifting teams where sometimes you're the lead of the team and sometimes you're helping on a team. Where you help me, I'll help you, together we'll get bigger things done. If I give half of my time to the community, in the other half of the time I can get 10 times as much done because I'm part of a community. So let's talk a little bit about um, sort of various research directions that w that we can go. And and one of the w things that I wanted to talk about or ask about was was this process of, of doing comparative analyses yeah. of genomes. From uh, I know um, uh, Manoli has a paper on comparing sets of mammalian genomes. And you know what what do we learn from that? What is the what's the goal there? Well. The way you learn how a genome functions is by changing it. If you go in and you tweak a letter in the genome, a nucleotide in the DNA, and it makes some difference, um, then you know it mattered. Well, it's a very slow process. But that actually is what evolution does, too. So evolution's constantly got mutations and selection. So if I compare two organisms that come from a common ancestor, and I see what was preserved, I can, with appropriate analysis, infer that that stuff is functional. If I look across the genome and I say what things occur many times, I can draw some inferences about that. So the real way to learn about something is to have a Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone helps you understand the, the contents of the genome. And so comparative analysis of different species is incredibly powerful. Uh, it teaches you about how much of the genome is under selection, which, which, which things are functional um, uh, comparisons across organisms, comparisons across people, comparisons of an organism and uh, of a normal human DNA and tumor DNA. It's all about comparison. So, um, to shift gears just a little bit, um, the uh, the the uh, Human Genome Project and of course the Broad are gigantic. Not just scientific, but management challenges, sure. um, and, and they obviously intersect with all sorts of policy uh, uh, ideas and issues. And I, I wanted to ask about the sort of intersection of science and politics, and sure. your your role as a as an advisor to uh, the president. Yep. Um, what what is the the sort of I mean, this is maybe kind of a softball question, but what is the what is the proper role of of a scientist, of a of a of an academic and an intellectual in these you know really huge kind of basic public debates that we keep seeming to step into. Uh, <laughs> well, which, which which public debates do you think? <laughs> well, I'll let you I'll let you decide. What well, you no, no. I mean, there there are but public debates where scientists don't have a particular role, sure. and there are some where they do. Yes, well, I um, guess I'm interested in the ones where they do. Yeah. Well, okay, so. Um, you know, there, there are uh, many, many, many important questions. First, science and technology are the engines of economic growth in this country. Um, you know, the vast majority of our GDP growth is, is attributable to innovation in one form or another. 
has been the case over the last 50, 60 years. Um, scientists have a responsibility to make sure that we nurture that engine. The scientific process, the, the basis of engineering and technology, these are really precious things that, that drive prosperity and um, progress and health and security in our environment. And scientists, first and foremost, need to be nurturing that. There are a lot of ways in which the nurturing of the scientific community is very different than politics. It's not about voting. There's a, you know, you don't run science uh, by putting things up to some popular vote. There are agreed upon notions of testing truth. And somehow the scientific community does a pretty great job of that. So that now, you know, then there are particular questions, um, questions about uh, how we should best be investing to uh, cure cancer in the long run, or whether, you know, what, how fast the climate is changing, for example, and what we can do about uh, mitigating climate change or adapting to climate change. These are, again, critical questions. There, there are a wide variety of questions uh, about cybersecurity, about um, about health information technology, about how to make better drugs, about um, nanotechnology, um, where the right answer depends on technical knowledge. So, um, you know, you wouldn't pretend to run the economy or influence the economy or react to economic shocks without understanding economics. You shouldn't be taking on technical questions without really understanding science. And so it's really important for scientists to step up and get involved in those public debates and public discussions. And um, the scientific method is an incredibly powerful way to do it. I guess there's also kind of a related question about um, sort of the general public, people like me who are non non scientists and our understandings of, of, of science and which may also tie back to science education. Um, I was wondering if you... Well, science uh, education is a critical part of it. Um, we need a public that, even if they can't do science, understand science. Um, it's important to understand the rational basis for uh, drawing conclusions. How do, you, how do you know anything in this world? How do you prove anything in this world? I mean, I certainly can't say that for every single scientific fact that I'm aware of, I'm aware of the scientific literature that supports every bit of it. You can't know everything like that. But I do know what it takes to prove things, and I do understand the structure of those, of, of those arguments and that logic, and we have a fantastic dynamic where the scientific community is self-correcting and self-criticizing, and where if some argument is bogus, you can pretty well count that there's going to be a young professor who's going to make hay by pointing out why it's bogus. And the thing about science is that if he's right, folk are going to agree. He's going to be able to prove that point. It may take a while, but it's not going to take that long. So we actually have a great way in science to adjudicate um, uh, disagreement and, and unorthodoxy. And it's not about opinion, it's about data. So that's a really good thing. And the most distinguished professor still loses to the graduate student if the graduate student's right. Yeah, I, I uh, would assume that teaching and education continues to be important to you, despite how much time you clearly have to invest in these other things. I mean, well, I mean, I still freshman biology. I still is, teach yeah. intro bio. I mean, yeah, I, so I, tell I, me about I, that. Well, I mean, I love teaching. I, I've for twenty years or more, I've taught the intro bio course seven hundred one two together with uh, you know Bob Weinberg for more than the last decade, um, and I love it. When I go into the the uh, intro bio classroom. And I have all these students, mostly freshmen, but some sophomores and occasional juniors and seniors. The energy of describing biology to a group of unjaded students who just s are hearing it for the first time, it just brings so much excitement to me. Because when I see how excited, I mean, I tell them about how exciting it is, but when I see that they really realize how exciting that is, it makes me more excited. So maybe I think it's fair to say I, I teach the intro bio course at MIT because selfishly it, it each time reignites my own energy for all this. It just makes me realize when I tell the stories about what, what this is about, just how amazing it is, how, how fantastic and interesting it is.
So I love doing that. So as someone who is just, I, I mean, I mean, it's kind of s staggering to me how many balls you must be sort of juggling between, <laughs> I mean, we haven't even talked about family life. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, y you know, thinking ahead, thinking ahead to sort of this sort of next phase of your career, I mean. Next have, phase, you know, I don't know. If you, how, how have you, you know, <laughs> do you, do you do you find yourself making conscious decisions about no. about what to take on and what to do? I mean, uh, early on, you you said you sort of were not. You were just kind of yeah. It's still the case. I mean, I, I mean, uh, co-chairing the president's council of advisors on science and technology is not something I ever planned to do. I was not, for example, active in the Obama campaign. I played no significant role in that. No role at all. Um, this was totally accidental, I suppose, that I got a phone call after the election saying, would I be willing to talk to them about doing something? And so, but having been all asked would I do something, you don't say no. You, f you, know, you feel an obligation to serve, but that it's not an act of planning. I think I've, I've sort of gotten by by dealing with things as they come up um, and feeling my way by instinct. If I had actually laid out a plan when I was in junior high school or high school or college or graduate school or any subsequent time, it would have been vastly less interesting than the plan that, that began to unfold. It wouldn't have included, you know, biology or the Human Genome Project or President's Council or any of these things. Um, you know, you kind of take some steps forward as best you can and you adjust it depending on how the world is changing and you try to have an impact on it and mostly you try to hang out with really great people with great generous institutions and good things happen. And you obviously one is thoughtful about it along the way, but the idea of advanced planning by a decade, what am I going to do with this next decade? I just find it doesn't work. You, you know, it's always much less interesting than what what unfolds. The other thing that's really fascinating is just to sort of think back to sort of your descriptions of the math team at Spice yeah. and, and the community and the collaboration. And then uh, it, it sounds kind of similar to the way you described the road. Honestly, it's yeah. like the math team. I mean, I uh, I've been lucky. I mean, I found that what I like, what gives me pleasure and satisfaction, is being part of a community that is bigger than yourself, that has some shared goal, it means a tremendous amount to me. Um, I don't think I would enjoy some job that didn't have that community element, that aspect of shared camaraderie, shared purpose, larger purpose, um, optimism about the future, trying to do something bigger and audacious. Um, and so, you know, maybe some people say, I know what I want to do. I want to study chemistry or I want to do this. I suspect that for me it's not that. It's that I like this way of working and uh, I like evolving to see what it's good for. Yeah, you know, I like math. I like biology. I like, you know, uh, other things. But I frankly love this kind of a spirit of, of how one works together, the cooperative spirit, I think. While it's interesting to see Washington from my role as on the President's Council, I have a hard time imagining how one could have a really good time in the midst of something so contentious where people appear to be trying to mostly tear each other down. What I love about science is, for the most part, people aren't trying to tear each other down. Your success doesn't interfere with my success. In fact, they build on each other. We actually want each other to succeed, particularly in medicine, where the enemies are a disease. Well, you know, who's, who's not opposed to cancer? And we're only going to do it by working together. So there's a built-in shared purpose. And there's really no return to tearing anybody else down. For those reasons, I love that. The same is about being around an institution with young people. MIT is an amazing institution. It's just filled with extraordinary young people who have just audacious ideas. They're unjaded. They, they have infinite possibility. And even though infinite possibility only ends up being finite eventually, um, it can be huge. If you don't start out with limitations and you take people who believe in infinite possibility, 
pretty amazing what they can produce. Well, that's a really wonderful place to leave things. I just want to say thank you for yeah. coming in to talk to us. It's My pleasure. Really Glad to be part of this great project.